What I want to do tonight is show you the context of the jhanas. So we're going to take a look at a sutta that illustrates the gradual training. The gradual training appears to be the curriculum that the monks and nuns practiced in the Buddha's dispensation. And it's, yeah, a really good outline of the path of practice. And the jhanas show up in this. And since it's an outline of the whole path of practice, and I mentioned earlier that the Buddha teachings could be divided into sila, samadhi, panya, you might guess that the gradual training contains aspects of sila, samadhi, panya. So I'm going to tell you the sutta, and you can try and notice which parts of the sutta have sila and which are samadhi and which ones are panya. This is a Samanyapala Sutta. We were looking at the hindrances and the jhanas from it the last couple of nights. Second one in the long discourses. It could be translated as the discourse on the fruits of the spiritual life. I'm going to give you my version of the Sutta. I suggest that after the retreat is over, you go to suttacentral.net and find Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation there. Sutta Central is a little funky to use. Uh, you need to click the hamburger menu, the three bars in the upper left, and then poke around until you find Digha Nikaya. And then you can find the sutta. And Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation is actually a good one. And it's the one that I used as a basis for what I'm going to give you tonight. Thus have I heard. Once the Blessed One was living in Jivaka's mango grove with a company of 1,250 monks just outside the great city of Rajagaha. Now, Jivaka, who had given the mango grove to the Buddha to use as a monastery, was the royal physician in the court of King Ajatasattu, King of Magadha. And on the night of our sutta, it was the full moon, and King Ajatasattu was sitting on the upper terrace of his palace, surrounded by his ministers and other members of the court. And when the full moon rose, King Ajatasattu uttered a joyful exclamation. Oh, what a beautiful night. Oh, what a wondrous night. Oh, what an auspicious night. Perhaps we could visit some recluse or Brahmin who can bring some peace to my mind. You see, King Ajatasattu had a very unpeaceful mind. This was because he had killed his father, good King Bimbasara. King Bimbasara actually met the Buddha before Siddhartha Gautama became the Buddha. Siddhartha Gautama was on alms round in Rajagaha. King Bimbasara was looking out of one of the upper windows of his palace, and he noticed this recluse down below, going from house to house. But he didn't seem like the usual recluses. He had a more regal bearing. So the king called some of his ministers over and said, see that recluse, follow him, see where he goes, and then come back and report back to me. So these three ministers followed Siddhartha Gautama back to Vulture's Peak, which is a mountain outside the city of Rajagaha. It's studded with caves, so it's an excellent place to meditate. And so while two of the ministers kept watch, one of them went back and informed the king. And so the king rode out on his chariot as far as he could, and then he walked up the mountain and went and introduced himself to Siddhartha Gautama inquired about his family and what was going on and how he became a recluse. And was so impressed, he offered Siddhartha Gautama a ministerial position in the court there in Rajagaha. But Siddhartha Gautama wanted to know what to do about old age, sickness, and death. He wasn't interested in politics, so he politely declined. 
But King Bimbisara got him to promise that if he figured it out, he'd come back and tell the king. And sure enough, three years after his awakening, the Buddha did return to Rajagaha and gave a discourse to King Bimbisara. And at the end of that discourse, King Bimbisara was established in the fruit of stream entry, meaning he attained the first level of awakening. And he became an ardent supporter of the Buddha. But King Bimbisara had a son, Prince Ajitasattu. And Prince Ajitasattu was an ambitious man. He grew weary of waiting for his father to die and decided to take matters into his own hands. He strapped a dagger to his thigh and went sneaking into the king's private quarters, where he was immediately apprehended by the guards. The guards brought him up to the king and said, great king, we found your son sneaking into your private quarters and he had this dagger strapped to his thigh. Son, why were you sneaking into my private quarters with a dagger strapped to your thigh? I was gonna kill you, dad. Why do you want to kill me? I want your kingdom. Why didn't you just say so? Here, you can be king. King Bimbasara is quite happy to turn the kingdom over to his son because King Bimbasara could now go out and practice the holy life. So King Ajitasattu got to be king and he didn't have to kill his father. But uh, he got worried. He was afraid that his father was going to get bored with all this meditation stuff and want his kingdom back. So he ordered his father thrown in the prison. He didn't have the heart to order his father killed. He just cut off all his food. He did allow one visitor, the queen. She was very shrewd. When she went to visit her husband, she would smear her body with honey and the king could live by licking it off. When King Bimbasara wasn't dying, King Ajitasattu went to see him. Dad, how come you're not dead yet? Oh, when your mother comes to visit, she smears her body with honey and I live by licking it off. End of visits from the queen. But still, King Bimbasara wasn't dying. So King Ajitasattu ordered him tortured. And while they were torturing the soles of his feet, he died. Two messages arrived in the palace simultaneously. The first message was that a son had been born to King Adetisatu's queen. And he knew for the first time a father's love for a son. And he said to his men, release my father from prison. And then they gave him the second message, which was that his father was dead. From that night on, King Ajitasattu had terrible nightmares. He would no sooner fall asleep than he would wake up screaming. And his servants would rush in. Great king, great king, are you all right? I'm fine, I'm fine. Go away, go away. Then he'd fall asleep and have another nightmare and wake up screaming. So on this full moon night, uh, the king has insomnia. He doesn't want to go to sleep because he'll just have nightmares. And if the king can't sleep, nobody gets to sleep. So all the ministers and Jivaka and other members of the court are sitting there on the upper terrace of the palace when the king utters his joyful exclamation about wanting to visit some recluse or brahmin. And immediately, one of the ministers pipes up and says, ah, there's Peruna Kasapa. He's long gone forth. He has many followers. He's esteemed as holy. He's in the last stage of his life. You should visit him. Perhaps he can bring some peace to your mind. The king said nothing. Another minister piped up. There's Makala Gosala. He's long gone forth. He has many followers. He's esteemed as holy. You get the picture? each of the ministers championing his recluse or Brahmin and the king saying nothing. After the hubbub died down, the king turned to Jivaka who was nearby. Jivaka, do you know any recluse or Brahmin we could visit who might bring some peace to my mind? Great king, the Buddha, the perfectly awakened one, 
is currently living in my mango grove with a company of 1,250 monks. He teaches the Dhamma, which is good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. Great king, you should go visit the Buddha. He may be able to bring some peace to your mind. Prepare the elephant vehicles, Jivaka. So Jivaka goes running down from the upper terrace of the palace down to the stables below. And he has 500 female elephants saddled up along with the king's royal bull elephant. And then he goes running back up to the upper terrace of the palace. Great king, the elephant vehicles are prepared. Do as you see fit. So the king had 500 women of the court seated one each on the 500 female elephants. And then he and Jivaka mounted up on the royal tusker and they went riding forth in full royal splendor with torchbearers going before. Must have been quite a sight on that full moon night. They rode out of the city of New Rajagaha and then through the old city and then out the south gate and hung a left and headed towards the mango grove. And when they got close to the mango grove, it was quiet. It was a little too quiet. Jivaka, are you turning me over to my enemies? Are you betraying me? No, great king. Why would you think that? You said there was 1,250 people in this mango grove. I don't hear a sound. They're probably all meditating, great king. Look, you can see lights in the pavilion hall. Go forward, great king. Go forward. So they went as far as they could go on the elephants. And then they dismounted, the king and Jivaka and the 500 women of the court. And they went into the pavilion hall. And when they stepped inside, the king is looking around. Now, which one's the Buddha? He's the one sitting at the back facing everyone else. So the king's wandering around, checking out the scene. He's actually quite impressed. He's up standing near to the Buddha when he says, oh, if only my son, the prince, could experience peace such as this. The Buddha hears him and says, great king, do your thoughts follow the call of your affection? Yes, indeed they do, venerable sir. I love my son, the prince, very much. And it would be wonderful if he could experience such peace as the company of bhikkhus experiences. And then the king saluted the Buddha, saluted the monks, and sat down at one side. Sitting there, he said, Venerable sir, may I ask you a question? Certainly, great king, ask whatever you wish. Venerable sir, in my kingdom, there are people who practice many different crafts. There are elephant trainers, horse trainers, archers, swordsmen, camp marshals, commandos, chain mail warriors. There are bakers, butchers, weavers, basket makers, barbers, street sweepers, accountants, statisticians. Each of them practices their craft and it's possible to see some fruit of their labor visible here and now. Venerable Sir, can you point out any fruit of the spiritual life that is visible here and now? Great King, have you ever asked this question of any other recluses or Brahmins? Well, yes, Venerable Sir, actually I have. I've asked half a dozen recluses or Brahmins about this matter, but they just preach their doctrine at me without ever answering the question. It was, well, it was like asking for a mango and being given a breadfruit, most unsatisfying. But I never said anything. I just went away quietly. So I ask you again, Venerable Sir, can you point out any fruit of the spiritual life visible here and now? Great King, I will ask you a question. Answer as you see fit. Suppose in your palace, there's a workman, a slave, who rises before you each morning sees that all of your needs are met, speaks politely to you at all times, doesn't go to bed until after you've gone to bed. 
Suppose this slave were to think, it is wonderful, it is marvelous, the destiny of meritorious deeds. For this king Ajitasattu is a man and I am a man, and yet he enjoys the five strands of sense pleasures as though he were a god, while I wait on him hand and foot from morning to night. Perhaps I too should do meritorious deeds. Great king, suppose that this slave were to shave off his hair and beard, put on the ochre robe, and go forth from the home life to the homeless life. Upon learning of this, would you send your soldiers saying, make that man come back here and be my slave? Oh no, venerable sir. We would rise up before him. We would prepare a seat. We would see to his food, clothing, shelter, and medicinal requirements. We would provide for him righteous protection. Great king, is this not a fruit of the spiritual life visible here and now? Uh, yes, yes, I guess it is, venerable sir. Venerable sir, can you point out any other fruit of the spiritual life visible here and now? Great king, I will ask you a question. Answer as you see fit. Suppose in your kingdom there's a farmer who toils in his fields from morning to night. And when it's harvest time, he pays a large portion of his harvest as taxes to support the royal treasury. Suppose this farmer were to grow weary of paying taxes. Suppose he were to think, it is wonderful, it is marvelous, the destiny of meritorious deeds. For this king Ajitasattu is a man and I am a man, and yet he enjoys the five strands of sense pleasures as though he were a god. While I toil in my fields from morning to night and at harvest time wind up paying a large portion of my harvest as taxes to the king. Perhaps I too should do meritorious deeds. Great king, suppose at some further time this farmer shaves off his hair and beard puts on the ochre robe, goes forth from the home life to the homeless life, and practices spirituality. Upon learning of this, would you send your soldiers saying, make that man come back here so he can be a farmer and support the royal treasury? Oh no, venerable sir, we would rise up before him. We would prepare a seat. We would see to his food, clothing, shelter, and medicinal requirements. We would provide for him righteous protection. Great king, is this not also a fruit of the spiritual life, visible here and now? Yes, yes it is, venerable sir. Venerable sir, can you point out any other fruit of the spiritual life, visible here and now, but more wondrous and more sublime than these? Listen carefully, great king. A Tathagata arises in this world. A Buddha, fully awakened, who teaches the Dhamma which is good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end. A householder or householder's child hears the Dhamma and gains faith. And think, household life is crowded and dusty. Going forth is free like the air. Great king, at some point this householder or householder's child or other person shaves off hair and beard, puts on the ochre robe, and goes forth from the home life to the homeless life, joins the Tathagata's order. Great king, when one joins the Tathagata's order, that person lives restrained by the precepts, the rules of behavior. There are many of these rules. The first one is, I undertake the training to refrain from killing living beings. The second one is, I undertake the training to refrain from taking that which is not given. There are many rules, great king. We're celibate. We don't lie. We don't use harsh or abusive language. We try and be peacemakers rather than cause division. We don't engage in gossip or idle chatter. We don't take intoxicants. We only eat in one part of the day. We don't adorn ourselves with garlands or perfumes or jewelry. We don't go to singing or dancing shows. We don't sleep in high and luxurious beds. We don't handle gold or silver. 
There are many rules, great king. By following these rules, it makes it possible to live with senses restrained. Upon seeing a sight with the eye, one does not grasp at the signs or secondary characteristics, lest evil, unwholesome states such as covetousness or grief overcome one. Upon hearing a sound with the ear, smelling a smell with the nose, tasting a taste with the tongue, touching a texture with the body, or thinking a thought with the mind, one does not grasp at the signs or secondary characteristics, lest evil, unwholesome states such as covetousness or grief overcome one. Great King, by living with senses restrained, it makes it possible to be mindful of all that we do. Mindful when going forward, mindful when coming back. Mindful when looking forward, mindful when looking back. Mindful when bending and stretching the limbs. Mindful when wearing the robe and carrying the alms bowl. Mindful when eating, chewing, savoring, and swallowing. Mindful when going to the toilet. Mindful when walking, standing, sitting, and lying down. Mindful when falling asleep and waking up. Mindful when speaking and keeping silent. We also are content with very little, great king. All we need is food, clothing, and shelter, and medicine if we're ill. It makes it possible for us to go wherever we wish, like a bird on the wing. Great King, with these noble precepts, this noble guarding of the senses, this noble mindfulness, and that no, this noble contentment, it makes it possible to do the work of a recluse. Upon returning from alms round, having eaten the midday meal, one resorts to a secluded dwelling, the root of a tree, the forest a hillside cave, a glen, a charnel ground, a heap of straw. One sits down cross-legged, holds one's body erect, and sets up mindfulness before oneself. Great King, when practicing meditation, there are five hindrances that can arise that hinder progress on the spiritual path. The first of these hindrances, Great King, is sensual desire. Sensual desire is like being in debt. If someone is in debt, they must continually work to pay off the debt. It's the same with sensual desire. No sense pleasure is ultimately satisfying, so one just simply works for more sensual pleasures. But if someone who is in debt was able to pay off that debt, they would rejoice and become glad. In the same way, if one can overcome sensual desire, even temporarily, one rejoices and becomes glad. The second of these hindrances, great king, is ill will and hatred. Ill will and hatred is like being physically ill. If someone is physically ill, they don't feel well. They can't think straight. They're hot. They can't do what they want to do. It's the same if someone is overcome with ill will and hatred. They don't feel well. They can't think straight. They're hot. They can't do what they want to do. But if someone who is physically ill were to take medicine and overcome that illness, they would rejoice and become glad. In the same way, if one can overcome ill will and hatred, even temporarily, one rejoices and becomes glad. The third of these hindrances, great king, is sloth and torpor. Sloth and torpor is like being in a prison. If you're in a prison, you just sit there, missing out on all the good things of life. If you're overcome with sloth and torpor, you just sit there, missing out on all the good things of spiritual life. But if someone were to gain release from prison, they would rejoice and become glad. In the same way, if one can overcome sloth and torpor, even temporarily, one rejoices and becomes glad. The fourth of these hindrances, great king, is restlessness and remorse. Restlessness and remorse is like being a slave. A slave is always busy, but busy doing what the master commands. Go there, do that. Come here, do this. But not what the slave wants to do. It's the same with restlessness and remorse. One is extremely busy, but not making any progress. Can't sit still. The mind is all over the place. 
But if a slave was to gain his freedom, he would rejoice and become glad. In the same way, if one can overcome restlessness and remorse, even temporarily, one rejoices and becomes glad. The fifth of these hindrances, great king, is skeptical doubt. Skeptical doubt is like being on a perilous desert journey where bandits abound and provisions are scarce. First one thinks to go this way, but no, there'll be bandits. Maybe better go this way, but there won't be any water. One does more starting and stopping than actual progressing. It's the same with skeptical doubt. One tries one practice and then another and another and never follows through on anything far enough to see where it leads. But if somebody on a perilous desert journey were to arrive at a place of safety, they would rejoice and become glad. In the same way, if one can overcome skeptical doubt, even temporarily, one rejoices and becomes glad. Great King, when one sees that these five hindrances are not abandoned, one regards that as being in debt, as being physically ill, as being a slave, as being in prison, as a desert road. But when one sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned, one regards that as freedom from debt, as good health, as release from prison, as freedom from slavery, as a place of safety. Thus secluded from sensual desires, secluded from unwholesome states of mind, one enters and remains in the first jhana, which is with thinking and examining and contains rapture and happiness born of seclusion. One drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion, so there is no part of one's body not filled with rapture and happiness. Great King, imagine a skilled bath attendant or his apprentice taking a metal basin and pouring in soap flakes and then just the right amount of water and mixing the soap flakes in the water until the soap flakes are pervaded by moisture, encompassed by moisture, inside and out, you have a homogeneous ball of soap that does not trickle. In the same way, one drenches deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of seclusion. So there is no part of one's body not filled with rapture and happiness. Great King, this is a fruit of the spiritual life, visible here and now, and more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. Further, Great King, with the subsiding of thinking and examining, by gaining inner tranquility and unification of mind, one enters and remains in the second jhana, which is without thinking and examining, and contains rapture and happiness born of concentration. One drenches deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration, so there is no part of one's body not filled with rapture and happiness. Great King, imagine a lake, Far up in the mountains, no streams coming in from the east, the west, the north, or south, not even showers of rain from time to time. And yet, at the bottom of the lake is a spring of cool, clear water. The cool, clear water would totally permeate the lake, totally fill the lake, so there would be no part of that lake not touched by the cool, clear water. In the same way, one drenches deep, saturates, and suffuses one's body with the rapture and happiness born of concentration, so there is no part of one's body not filled with rapture and happiness. Great King, this too is a fruit of the spiritual life, visible here and now, and more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. Further, Great King, with the fading away of rapture, by remaining imperturbable, mindful, and clearly aware, one experiences happiness with the body, one enters the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, happy is one who is equanimous and mindful. One drenches deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with this happiness free from rapture, so there is no part of one's body not filled with happiness. Great king, imagine a lotus pond filled with blue, white, or red lotuses that grow up out of the mud but do not come above the surface of the water. They would be completely filled with water from their tips to their roots. In the same way, one drenches deep, saturates and suffuses one's body with a happiness free from rapture, so there is no part of one's body not filled with happiness. Great King, 
This too is a fruit of the spiritual life, visible here and now, and more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. Further, great king, with the passing of pleasure and pain and with the previous passing of joy and grief, one enters and remains in the fourth jhana, a state beyond pleasure and pain that contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. One sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind. So there is no part of one's body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. Great King, imagine a man covered from the head down by a white cloth. So there is no part of his body not suffused by the white cloth. In the same way, one sits suffusing one's body with a pure, bright mind. So there is no part of one's body not suffused with a pure, bright mind. Great King, this too is a fruit of the spiritual life, visible here and now, and more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. Further, great king, with a mind thus concentrated, clear, sharp, bright, malleable, wieldy, and given to imperturbability, one directs and inclines it to knowing and seeing. One understands thus, this is my body, having material form, composed of the four great elements, born of mother and father, fed on rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness, which is bound up with it and supported by it. Great King, insights into the nature of reality such as these are also fruits of the spiritual life, visible here and now, and more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. Further, great king, with a mind thus concentrated, clear, sharp, bright, mable, wieldy, and given to imperturbability, one can direct and incline it to creating a mind-made body, to wielding the supernormal powers, such as being one, becoming many, being many, becoming one, appearing and disappearing at will, walking on water, diving into the earth as though it was water, passing through walls and ramparts unimpeded, flying cross-legged through the sky as though one were a bird, wielding mis mastery over the body as far as the Brahma realms. One can also hear sounds at a great distance. One can know the minds of others. One can remember past lives. One can see beings passing away and re-arising according to their karma. Great King, psychic powers like these are also fruits of the spiritual life, visible here and now, and more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. Further, great king, with a mind thus concentrated, clear, sharp, bright, malleable, wieldy, and given to imperturbability, one can direct and incline it to the destruction of the asavas, the intoxicants. One can understand, this is dukkha. This is the origin of dukkha. This is the cessation of dukkha. This is the path of practice that leads to the cessation of dukkha. One can understand, these are the intoxicants. This is the origin of the intoxicants. This is the cessation of the intoxicants. This is the path of practice that leads to the cessation of the intoxicants. And one can follow that path all the way to the end and put an end to the intoxicant of sense desire, put an end to the intoxicant of becoming, put an end to the intoxicant of ignorance. And having done so, great king, one puts an end to all dukkha. Great king, this too is a fruit of the spiritual life, visible here and now, and more wondrous and more sublime than the previous. And furthermore, great king, there is no fruit of the spiritual life more wondrous and more sublime than this. The king was impressed. Wonderful, marvelous. It, it's like setting up right something that's been knocked down. It's like finding something that was hidden. It's like pointing out the way to one who is lost. It's like bringing a light 
into a darkened room so that those who have eyes can see. I go for refuge to the Buddha and to the Dharma and to the Bhikkhu Sangha. May the Buddha please consider me a lay follower from this day forth as long as life shall last. And then the king got all shamefaced and finally he blurted out, Venerable Sir, a transgression overcame me in that for the sake of rulership, I killed my father, a righteous man and a righteous king. Indeed, great king, a transgression overcame you in that you killed your father, a righteous man and a righteous king. But it is good that you acknowledge this transgression for the sake of your restraint in the future. And then King Ajitasatu said, we must be going. We have many things to do. Do as you see fit, great king. So the king saluted the Buddha, saluted the monks, circumambulated the Buddha, and then keeping the Buddha on his right, headed back to where the elephants were parked, he, and Jivaka, and all the women of the court, and they mounted up, they rode back to the palace. Not too long after the king had departed, the Buddha said to the monks, this king has ruined himself. This king has destroyed himself. If he had not killed his father, a righteous man and a righteous king, the stainless eye of Dhamma would have opened in him tonight and he would have attained stream entry, the first stage of awakening. But this king has destroyed himself. This king has ruined himself. And the monks were very pleased with all that the Buddha taught. Now the sutta ends here, but the commentaries go on to say that King Ajitasattu went back to the palace and had his first good night's sleep since his father died. And he did become a great Buddhist disciple. He was a great follower of the Dharma. After the Buddha's death, there was the first great council where 500 fully awakened disciples of the Buddha came together to recite the rules for the monks and nuns and to recite all the Buddha's teachings, the suttas. And the place they chose to come together was in a cave just outside of Rajagaha. They obviously felt that they were safe there with protection of King Ajitasattu. But King Ajitasattu was an ambitious man. After the Buddha's death, he set out on wars of conquest and conquered all of the neighboring kingdoms and republics and built the nucleus of the first great Indian empire. But not all went well for King Ajitasattu. You see, his son killed him. And his grandson killed his son. And his great-grandson killed his grandson. And his great-great-grandson killed his great-grandson. And at that point, the people of Magadha said, enough of these father killers. They killed the last of the line and established a new dynasty.